Well, hello, friends from back. It's uh, good to be here in your church and uh, good to bring God's word to you. Uh, my prayers for you as you uh, look forward one day soon, hopefully, to uh, being back in church for live services. And I look forward to being with you uh, at the end of September, so long as uh, Richmond beat Collingwood by then. Um, I'll be here. If we don't, I'll cancel. But anyway, good to be with you. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Our gracious God and Father, speak to us from your word. Shine its light in our hearts so that we may live and love for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Where is love? Does it fall from skies above? Is it underneath the willow tree that I've been dreaming of? What an inane line. Musicals are full of stupid lines, it seems to me, about love. Love can touch us one time and last for a lifetime and never let go till we're gone. Love lifts us up where we belong. All you need is love. Well, I hope I haven't made you sick with all that meaningless drivel, that sweet, soppy sentimentality about love. But the world buys it every time. It loves love and it loves that sort of soppy feeling of sweet love. And then you come to 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a vicar, many times the bride and the groom-to-be uh, would say, well, we'd like that reading that was read for Princess Diana, uh, for her funeral, I think for her wedding. Uh, where's it from? What's it about? It's all about love. Oh, 1 Corinthians 13. And of course, I remember still Tony Blair reading it at Diana's funeral masterfully. It's not an easy passage to read. But this is more than a nice poem about love. I would explain to the wedding couples what it meant. And sometimes they say, oh, is that what it's about? Can we pick something else then? Because this, this is not actually a poem about love. And it's not words that are meant to make us feel good and sweet and sentimental. But rather, in fact, this famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, is an accurate missile piercing the Corinthians' loveless hearts. Uh, they loved speaking in tongues, and you will have seen some of that, I think, in recent weeks in the sermons. They saw tongues as a sign of spiritual maturity and prowess, I think. And Paul brings them down to earth when he says at the beginning of chapter 13, if I speak in the tongue of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Wow. Here are Corinthians boasting about their gifts of speaking in tongues, but actually Paul's implying here, subtly I think, that they're not much more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And that's what noisy pagans would do in their temple. That's probably the background of the illustrations he's using in that verse. You think it's spiritual maturity, but if you're loveless, you're no better than a pagan. That's a bit of a shock. But it's not just about speaking in tongues. It's the same with prophecy, which is a gift that Paul himself aspired to and valued and esteemed. So if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, or there's various translations for that, but do not have love, I am nothing. And it's the same for in that, not just the prophetic powers, but the gifts of knowledge. They boast about that in earlier chapters of this letter. The Corinthians thought that that was a sign of spiritual maturity, having made it spiritually, but no love, nothing, is what Paul says. And they boasted about their faith. If you had faith even to move a mountain, but no love is nothing. Even if you have all of those gifts to the full, without love, nothing. And then thirdly, he uses the illustration of uh, giving everything away, maybe dying as a martyr. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast or even maybe burned, that's a complicated translation as well, but do not have love, that's the key point. 
I gain nothing. That is, you might live a life of giving lots away, but you can give lots away without love. You gain nothing. All the things that are mentioned there are good things. Paul's not saying speaking in tongues or prophecy or having faith or giving away possessions. He's not saying they're bad things. They're good things. The Corinthians boasted of them. Paul values them. But without love, they're useless. What Paul is saying in these first three verses, using three different examples, a parallel structure that adds, I think, great impact rhetorically as you hear it spoken, is that love is indispensable for the Christian. A loveless Christian gains nothing, is nothing, is not much better than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Love is indispensable. But then he goes on now to describe the character of love in verses 4 to 7. It's not a definition of love. I don't think Paul is writing a dictionary definition here. But rather it seems that he's describing love, the character of love, but he's targeting that description for the context of the Corinthians. If Paul were here at back, it's hard to know what he would say. I don't know you well enough and Paul would need to know you well what would he say about love to this congregation, to this church? You see, the things that Paul picks up on when he describes the character of love are absent or lacking or deficient in the life of the Corinthians. Love, you see, is patient and kind. But you Corinthians are not. You see, you can't even wait at the Lord's Supper. That's in chapters uh, uh, 11. You're lacking patience. Love is kind, but you seem to be unkind to the poor. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant. You see, a patient and kind love is not jumping to judge those who wrong you. That's chapter 6. And the first two positives, love is patient, is kind, is implying you are lacking patience and lacking kindness. But then the description is negatives. Love is not envious, oh, but you do, because you have rivalries and factions and pride at certain gifts. There's envy being expressed there with the divisions of Peter and Paul and, Apollo and Apollos and so on in chapter 3 and the different gifts you envy or pride yourselves in in chapter 14. Love is not like that. Love does not boast, but you do. You boast of your knowledge, you boast of your spiritual gifts, you boast of your wisdom, uh, chapters 3 and 8 and 14, all the way through 1 Corinthians, really. Love is not like that. Love is not proud. <laughs> but you, Corinthians, you're puffed up. You're proud. You're arrogant, in fact, with your gifts and your knowledge. Chapter 4 or 5 or 8 all allude to that sort of thing. Love isn't like that. And love is not rude or maybe shameful would be another way of translating that. But you Corinthians are. You don't feel ashamed at the immorality that's expressed in chapter 5, the way men treat women in chapter 7, the way the women dress in church in chapter 11. Love's not like that. Love is not self-seeking, but you are. The way you eat meat, disregarding the weaker brother, putting yourself first. The way you treat others at the Lord's table, ignoring others in the fellowship, chapters 10 and 11. All you think about is yourself. Love's not like that. Love is not easily angered. But you are because you take each other to court, as chapter 6 said. Love's not like that. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Oh, but you do because you do take people to court. You keep a record of wrongs. You've got factions and rivalry. Love's not like that. Love doesn't seek to settle accounts, it wipes out the debt. 
And love does not, re, uh, does not rejoice in wrongdoing. But you do. The man who commits immorality in chapter 5, the pride of sexual immorality also in chapter 6, but love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. It endures all things, that is. It puts up with lots, does love. It's tenacious. It's solid. It's for richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Love believes all things, not meaning gullible, stupid and naive, but rather love is resilient in trusting and believing in God, regardless of circumstances. Love, you see, true love, proper love, not soppy, sweet, sentimental love you see in the films and musicals, but real, substantial love is full of faith in God. And love hopes all things. Hopes always, really. Doesn't mean that you're a happy optimist that always look on the bright side of life, it'll be better tomorrow, that sort of naivety, but rather full of gospel hope. Deep, lasting, sure, certain hope. A hope that will be expressed in just two chapters' time with the substance of the resurrection of Jesus. True love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. You see, love is indispensable. That was the first point of the first three verses. And then this, this character of love, what love really is, it's not for us to define, and it's not an emotion only. It's not something that we feel. It's got substance to it, objectivity to it. It's real. But the third point, the final point in this chapter, is the permanence of love. Love never ends in verse 8. But as for prophecies, that you boast in pride and esteem, and they, they'll come to an end. As for tongues which you value and are good things, they will cease. And as for knowledge which you Corinthians get puffed up and boast about, it will come to an end. Love never ends. It's a bit like being a child. Childhood ends. Well, some of us are sad that it did, but childhood ends. We become adults. We are meant to act like an adult. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, like childhood into adulthood, the partial will come to an end. See, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became an adult, by and large, I put aside my childish ways. You see, all these spiritual gifts are in a sense for the childhood of faith. They're not enduring forever, they don't last forever, they're not permanent. Love never ends. Or to use another illustration, for now we see in a mirror dimly. Our mirrors are quite good these days, but 2,000 years ago they are a little bit more opaque than we're used to. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now, face to face is a bit of a, a relic for us who've been in social isolation for weeks, but it means that you're actually in the same space, not on a camera or a video. You might remember it from March and earlier months. What Paul's saying here, in effect, is that, that the permanence of love is something that, that is face to face. The mirror gives you a reflection, but it's not the perfect thing, and it doesn't last. The real thing is the face to face. That's where love fits. For now, in this life on earth, we see but in a mirror dimly. But then we will see face to face. You see, now I know only in part, like a child, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Just like a childhood is not permanent, 
so too the spiritual gifts and indeed our experiences of being a Christian here on earth in a fallen world before the return of Jesus. But love never ends. And just like a mirror is imperfect, a reflection, and what is better is to see face to face the reality, so that's love that lasts from now to then. There's a little old saying you may be familiar with, faith will vanish into sight, hope will be satisfied in delight, but love alone will shine more bright. You see, here on earth, now, faith, looking for something that is not yet fully seen or even seen, as Hebrews 11, for example, puts it, Faith is imperative for us, essential for us now. But when we see God face to face, when the fullness of the reality of the kingdom is upon us, in a sense, faith will vanish into sight. And hope, hope's critical now, central to the gospel, a hope that's grounded in the substance of the resurrection of Jesus. But once hope is realized, it's satisfied with delight. No more hope when the reality is there. You know, I hope with confidence for Richmond to win another premiership this year, of course. Eventually, your vicar will change his ways, hopefully. But once we win the premiership, my hope of winning the premiership has been fulfilled. And so what Paul is saying here is these three great Christian virtues, faith, hope, and love, all of them are essential now here on earth. Faith, looking forward to something yet to be realized. Hope, trusting in, looking forward again to something to be realized. But when it's realized, faith and hope go. But love? Love now and then. Love now in part, not yet complete, not yet perfect love. But when the kingdom comes, when the Lord returns, when we're in glory, love will be perfected. Love never ends. This famous chapter is a rebuke to a loveless church, the Corinthians. They were the things that this description of love was not. They boasted, they were arrogant, they kept records of wrong, and so on. They prized other good things above love. Love is indispensable for the Christian. The character of love as it's described here, patient, kind, But if Paul were writing to you at back, would he say the same things exactly in verses 4 to 7? Are there other ways that that you demonstrate a lovelessness in your church that Paul might shape the way he describes the character of love to fit your context more sharply? And then the permanence of love. Love never ends So often in churches we find good, right battles for truth, good, right battles for justice, good, right battles for gifts or practices of various sorts. But primary over all of that is love. For you, if you have all the spiritual gifts in the world but no love, nothing. A love that is patient, kind, keeps no record of wrongs and so on. A love that endures all things. And then to value it because love never ends. Don't be conned by the weakness of love in our society or world. You see, love is not soppy, sickly, sweet, uh, sensual sentimentality. But love is robust kind, patient, selfless, drawing its strength from God, drawing its strength from the perfect love of God in Christ, full of faith and hope, but preeminently love. Make this love your aim, for this is still the more excellent way. Let's pray. God our Father, stir up in us love like this, that we may love each other deeply and permanently, that we may love you and therefore others, even the unlovely. 
And we thank you that you love us despite ourselves in Christ. Amen.